the I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast, live. You're down with Rappaport, yes I am. 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 You better tune in, IamRappaport.com. Cause every single podcast, you know he drops bombs. I seen him on set, a seasoned vet with true talent. Catch him on his way to CrossFit, rocking the new balance. He asked me to do the track, cause he know I rhyme elite. But I'm just waiting for the Robert De Niro line of the week. Breakfast of champions, toasted bagel, cream cheese, and locks. This is I Am Rappaport. The show never stops. You might catch him out in public, stretching his knees. But if you don't listen to the show, yo, wiggle please. Wiggle, 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 wi
motherfucker. It's cold tanking. And we are actually, we are actually in full tank mode. And, and I don't blame the Knicks. I don't blame Coach Fisdale at all. At this point, who are we fooling? We're not winning anything. We're not going anywhere. We traded that fuck, that stick figure, Gimp Porzingis, and we lost the game. Dolan has been ridiculed. Listen, if James Dolan still owns the team when the New York Knicks win a championship, and at some point we're going to win a championship, it's the Knicks. If we won a championship in the Garden, Game 7 in the most dramatic Game 7 ever, you know when the team goes up to accept the trophy and they give the Larry O'Brien championship trophy to the owner, who's James Dolan? Even if we win in a Game 7 in the most dramatic, crazy way, when they say the owner of the New York Knicks, James Dolan, receives the Larry O'Brien Trophy, the entire garden will boo this motherfucker. On our best day as New York Knicks fans in the modern era, we will boo him. We don't like him. We don't feel uh, any, uh, I don't know. We, we don't relate to him in, in any way, shape, or form. So he's walking out of the game Saturday uh, into the tunnel. We know his whole history. We, we, we know it. Everybody knows it. The whole thing with Oakley when he sent his goons after Oakley. So as he's walking out, a fan says to him, sell the team. Actually, the whole thing was caught on tape. Uh, Miles Jordan, uh, Miles uh, Davis and Jordan Winter, the sound uh, man extraordinaire, the uh, producers of the Iron Rap Poor Stereo podcast, uh, uh, Miles and Jordan, a.k.a. the Dust Brothers, play that clip. Sell the team! Anything I can sell, sell the team? It. You want to not come to any more games? Why? Yeah, that's rude. It's an opinion. Uh, no, it's not an opinion. And you know what? Enjoy watching them on TV. Him. Him. What? Bring up yeah. Him. Hold him for Kevin. Hold him for Kevin. Hold him for Kevin. And you hear James Dolan say, uh, "Don't come back. You're not welcomed here." And then he sends his guys to flag him, and the guy has been banned. This fan who bought tickets has been banned by Madison Square Garden. James Dolan, you fuck you. You fuck you. You're so at it, you little gnome. You little five foot six bearded fake blues man cock sucker, you. You know, you did that guy a favor by banning him. There's no product on the floor this season that anybody should be paying for. Listen, I can't urge... And I can't sway people to do what, what they... Most people already bought tickets to the game. But the only way to get it through this piece of shit's head, through this, through this billionaire baby spoiled brat who's in a blues band, the only way to get it through his head is to just stop going to the games. I don't know why New Yorkers continue to pay hard-earned money to go see this team, to see this product, then to be thrown out and banned from Madison Square Garden because you, it's not like he cursed them out and said, you little bearded fuck you. Sell the team, you little cocksucker. He didn't say that. He said, sell the team. A Dolan approaches him with his big teeth that are probably made out of wood or linoleum or some shit like that. And he, 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 he sounds all stupid. An owner walk past him. He didn't curse at you. He didn't say anything bad, disrespectful. You, you, you're so thin-skinned for a billionaire. Buy yourself some. You got yourself hair. You obviously bleach your beard and your hair. Get yourself some thicker skin. James, have you ever seen James Dolan sitting courtside, win, lose, or draw? He looks miserable. He looks like he's ready to run into the bathroom to go take a deuce. To drop a deuce. He never looks happy, never looks satisfied, never looks happy to be there. Even when the Knicks are winning, he just looks miserable. Sell the team. Okay, we don't relate to you. We do not like you. I talked about this the other day. I think it was on the premium primetime I Am Rap Report Stereo podcast. Adam Silver uh, was at some panel for the NBA and, and, and he was talking about 
a, a league-wide concern that he has for the mental health of uh, uh, the majority or a lot. I don't want to say majority. A lot of players that he spoke to, young players in their 20s, are, are, are saying they're unhappy, unsatisfied, and suffering from symptoms of depression while being in the NBA. And, and they're saying that they're secluded. They're isolated. Uh, players are, are spending so much time on their phones. There's no team bonding. Um, if you're a 23-year-old NBA star, you don't need to go to the club to freak off. You don't need to go to the club to pull something to run stunts in the telly. You don't need to uh, uh, even go out of the, the hotel to eat. You could Postmate. You could room service. And a lot of these young players are, are saying they're feeling sadness. Imagine being a 23-year-old NBA star who's making $20 million a year or $5 million a year or whatever they're making. Not that money buys you happiness. Money does not buy you happiness. But imagine dreaming your whole life. I want to play in the NBA. I want to play in the NBA. I want to play in the NBA. You work. You work. You have your God-given talent. Uh, you have luck. Everything falls into place. You have your health. And you make it into the NBA. And when you get there, you're unsatisfied and ultimately depressed because all you do is fuck around on your phone. This is coming from Adam Silver's mouth. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm depressed. I'm sad. I'm a guy who spent every single waking hour going to the park playing basketball. Okay? I'm a guy who spent hour after hour working on my right hand. I still don't have one. I never had one. I'm depressed. I'm sad that at 48 years old, soon to be 49 years old, once a month, I literally have dreams that I am playing professional basketball. That's sad. That's depressing. That's pathetic. You 22-year-old NBA players with your phones stuffed up your ass are sad and depressed? No, I think this word depressed is being thrown. Listen, if you're depressed, you need to get clinically evaluated before you go around telling people you're actually depressed. Because severely and really depressed people, they need medication. You need some meds, Duke? You, you need some medication? Because you're playing for I don't know what team. You got uh, money coming in for the rest of your life. You got uh, your family's taken care of. You're a star in the NBA. And you need some medication. What's the problem? Put your phones down. Learn to socialize. Learn to say hello. Go learn to pick up a woman in real life. These phones are taking their toll on all of us. Now, I am addicted to my phone. I know that. But I'm, I'm already gone. I've already burned and used all the brain cells that I'm ever going to possibly use in my life. I'm 48. I'm going to be 49 on March 20th. Okay? 40 fucking nine. I could look at my phone. I could Facebook. I could do all that shit. My life, the plan of it is already, it's already laid out. You know, yeah, you want to add to it. You want to improve on things. But if you're a young kid, put those. Just do an hour a day. An hour a day will keep the doctor away, literally. It's no longer an apple a day. An hour a day of phoneless activity will keep the doctor away. This is like a severe thing that's going on in the NBA. Why would Adam Silver talk about this? But I don't want to keep hearing about these kids say they're depressed, they're depressed. Go to the cuckoo's nest. Okay, we need to do a full evaluation on you. And you and let the doctor say if you're depressed or not. And he might just say, you need to put your phone down and learn how to socialize with your teammates. This depression word is being thrown around. This is a real thing, depression. It's like having a virus. It's a, it's a mental it's a mental illness, like having a swollen ankle. It needs to be looked at and treated as such. You can't, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. That's like saying, uh, uh, I got a torn meniscus, I got a torn meniscus. It's not the same, but it is the same. I am Rappaport Podcast. What else is going on? Uh, former UFC champion. Now he's just a champion of fucking up. Uh, Conor McGregor. Right before we uh, turned on the golden mics of the I Am Rappaport Stereo podcast, Conor McGregor was arrested in Miami. 
charged with strong arm robbery after he grabbed a fan's fu- listen I don't fuck with UFC dudes Conor McGregor says stop filming stop filming apparently a uh, fan uh, fans uh, but this particular fan was filming McGregor McGregor grabbed his phone and then broke it stomped it and all this other shit I, I wouldn't want that to happen because these guys could kick you in the fucking throat uh, kick you in the knee and end you ASAP. Uh, so Conor McGregor is arrested again. Uh, we all know about his, his stuff uh, with Vegas after he got the shit beaten out of him by Khabib. Uh, and then, of course, in Brooklyn the year before where he threw uh, the, 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 the ladder thing through the bus. He had to pay fines and all this stuff. This guy's a fuck up. Um, and, you know, I break his balls, but I, I like Conor McGregor. He's good for UFC. He's got a great story. Uh, uh, but you got to hold your head. You got to hold your head, Conor McGregor. Uh, speaking of holding your head, uh, speaking of booger sugar, 3,200 pounds of that pure Colombian booger sugar, 3,200 pounds, $77 million in booger sugar, in cocaine, was seized in a port in New York and Newark, New Jersey, they're saying it's the largest seizure of booger sugar in 25 years. Uh, uh, the booger sugar came from Colombia. Colombia. That's the, yo, Colombia's got to be the booger sugar capital of the world. I think people think that it comes from Mexico. Now, I, I, I follow the cartel. I watch the documentaries. Uh, I, I watch those shows and all that stuff. But I believe... I believe the, the purest form of, of that good booger sugar does, in fact, still come from Colombia. Um, I don't know whose shipment that was. Uh, I don't know who was expecting to get paid, but there's going to be a lot of motherfuckers in trouble, okay? When you lose $77 million worth of work, that's essentially work. When you lose $77 million worth, somebody is in some deep, Shit. Okay? Somebody's not making it home for dinner tonight. Finally, I got a, I got a movie that I, I highly, I highly recommend to everybody. It's excellent. Um, it's called Free Solo. It just won Best Documentary at the Academy Awards. Um, and it's about this guy who I had heard about a couple of times before. I, I know that I first got hip to him on 60 Minutes. You know, 60 Minutes, they did a piece on him. His name is Alex Ho Honold. I think it's H-O-N-O-L-D. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Alex Honold. Um, he's a free climber. Duke climbs uh, cliffs, uh, rock cliffs that are like climbing up the side of a buildings with no rope, no attachments, hence the name Free Solo. And it's literally, watching this movie is literally, you feel nauseous at times because the way they shoot it, and when you're watching this guy climb this mountain, it's a cliff that no one has ever climbed before uh, by free, with no ropes. People have climbed it, but they use ropes. Uh, they're tethered to things. This fucking sicko. And he's nuts. And, and they examine his brain and they find that uh, at one point uh, during the film, they examine his brain and they find that he's missing the thing in your brain that most people have uh, that gives you fear. Or he has a lower amount of that than the average person. Um, and it, you, you, I don't fuck with um, roller coasters and scary rides. I don't like bumps. I don't like boats. I, I don't like a lot of things. Um, but one of the things that I definitely, I don't like turbulence. Okay. I, I don't like any of that slick shit. Um, but you literally, feel, I haven't had this feeling since I was doing True Romance. When I did True Romance, when we shot that film, True Romance, uh, there's a roller coaster scene. Um, and, and it was hell for me. And it was the only scene in the film that we had to reshoot. So we had to go back to the roller coaster. Um, and it was, it was terrible for me. The first time I literally thought I was going to die. Like I was throwing up 
And the late, great Tony Scott was begging me, please just do one, one more take, one more take. We need to go for one more ride. And then after that, three weeks later, we had to go back. And then they gave me some medicine. And I was fine. Um, but you literally feel like you're on a roller coaster watching this. Uh, or like you're in a free-falling elevator. Um, now, that might not be appealing to people. But you have to see it because it's, it's so crazy that this guy climbs up the side of cliffs. They're not mountains. He climbs up the side of cliffs that are like literally straight. And it's sometimes like he'll, he'll scale uh, parallel, like around curves and stuff like that with no rope. And he talks about uh, the adrenaline and the rush and the search for perfection. Because if you're doing that, you must be perfect. There, there's no, there's no uh, minutia. There's no room for the slightest bit of imperfection. You, there, if there's any imperfection, you die. He's very well aware of that. Like his his pending death is discussed a lot. Like he's very aware of it because all these rock climbers, these crazy people, even the people who film it who are professional rock climbers, they talk about, oh, this guy passed, this guy passed, this guy passed, this guy was the greatest climber. He made a mistake. He died. Um, but I had heard about this film, and like I said, I saw him on 60 Minutes. I can't recommend this film. Uh, any higher it's it's excellent and it's just an incredible feat and the way it's shot and you really get a sense that you're up there with him um and the, you know it's not only uh from his point of view because the the, the, the guys filming it they're like i don't want to be the one filming it to watch this guy fall to his death like it's very out in the open it's not like a secret like everybody's aware like that could happen while you're filming it um so i can't recommend free solo any uh, any higher it's it's dope it's on iTunes, and I believe it's on Hulu, um, and it's just dope. And the name of the movie is Free Solo. It just won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. It's won a bunch of awards for documentaries this year. It just came out. It's a National Geographic film, and it's sick. All right, that's it. That's it. Here we go. Um, the conversation with Mike Tyson just starts. Uh, we just started talking uh, uh, and the microphones were rolling. We started talking about uh, the first question that we get into uh, with Mike is the first time he was in Los Angeles. And you, you'll catch him on the I Am Rapport Stereo podcast here mid-conversation. He's talking about being in Los Angeles for the first time and the experience he was having uh, being around people in L.A. for the first time in 1984. Without further ado, from Brooklyn, New York... Iron Mike Tyson. It's Iron Mike and White Mike on the I Am Rappaport Stereo Podcast. I never saw black people that talk nice before. Every time we had acting and tough and all, they were like, hey guy, how you doing? <laughs> you remember wow. the first time you came to LA? Um, 1984 for the Olympic trial, the fight for the, the Olympic trials. Damn, 84. For yeah. the 88 Olympics or for, 84. The, for the 84 Olympics? For the 84 Olympics, yeah. How old were you? 1817. Shit. Was that the great? Yeah, that was the great Olympic team, right? It was Breland? Yes, yes. Evander must have been trying out he was, too? He, he won the gold bronze medal. Oh, my other guy that you wind up fighting, the heavyweight, he who won the, uh, the tall dude with the fade, um, you fought him. Terra Biggs. Biggs. Yeah, Terra Biggs. Um, uh, Purnell too, right? Uh, Purnell was so beautiful. Yeah, he was a great fighter. He was a great fighter, right? Yeah, he was the greatest. He should have won an Outstanding Fighter Award. Do you do you keep in touch with any of them dudes? No, I see them periodically. You know, sometimes these guys run through hard times. Fighters, a lot of fighters, you know, if they're not fortunate, they run through hard times. Even if they got they retire with money, you know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe it's just the thing about fighters. Once we stop, we don't know what the fuck we're going to do. We're trying to chase that fucking feeling again. Then we go to drugs. It's the closest thing. Drugs can't get you there. It can't get you that adrenaline from fighting and stuff, but it's the closest thing to it. Yeah, as a fan, you know, it crushes me to see the fighters. I mean, it's, it's been so documented, the fighters over time. One thing or another happens to them. Obviously, I mean, you know, I mean, guys in New York, I remember I used to see Iran Barkley oh, outside, of, outside of clubs. He was such a great fighter. And he just looked, he didn't look good, like he wasn't well. You know, he looked like he wasn't healthy, you know, like well. yeah. And all the fighters that you, you hear about struggling, you know, with one thing or another and the money. What, what do you think about the business? You know, your, your stuff has been so documented. And if you talk about the business model with fighters, why they get fucked. And well, if you listen. were able to say to young fighters now about 
obviously beyond just save your money, but like if you were able to help fighters with their money now, what would you do to try to say, do this, do that? Well, just basically, the only, only thing you need now in boxing is your trainer and your lawyer. That's in terms of need. paying? Huh? In terms of paying? Yes, in terms of paying and taking care of everything and arranging everything and your, your cuts with your promoters and everything and your closed circuit funds and all that stuff. That's all you need as a lawyer to look after that stuff. Motherfuckers are paying too many people and this one and that one and hanging you know, Listen, um, most of us are insecure motherfuckers. Look where we come from. So we have to have some hanger-ons. Right. Make, you know, we make us feel at home or something. Because a lot of this stuff is just throwing us off. These hotel rooms, these women, all this stuff at, at your leisure, that really throws people off that came from absolutely nothing, you know? Now they got people calling you sir and mister. You're the greatest. Pumping your head up. You're the greatest. Love, I love sucking your dick. You're the great this and that. And so you believe that you're this super nigga. Now, you're not, you're not the street guy. You're the super nigga. You're special. You believe in your mind, at least. Right. Right. Is there a way to help these fighters with like because people think like boxers like you know obviously Mayweather and Pacquiao there's there's the elite guys but there's guys that are like you know they're out there we watch them bang for twelve rounds they're fucking making a hundred thousand dollars you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars they're getting banged around no one ever in the world of boxing this is the only time we can ever do that somebody can have um some kind of league for fighters you know what I mean. Uh, a welfare league, some league for the league of fighters, retired fighters or something. Like a sanctioned thing, like an organized thing. It has thing. to be because we're watching these guys just go to waste, you know. Because before in the 80s when they didn't make it, they went to being um, strong arm guys for the drug dealers and stuff. Right. You know, I remember seeing all the guys used to box in the Junior Olympics with me as kids. That you'd fight? No, I would probably fight somebody on their team, but right. we became friends. And we seen from Philadelphia guys, some L.A. guys from Chicago, guys from all over the country. And the next thing, guys from New Orleans, the next thing you know, you hear these big wave of dope dealers, and you find out, wow, that's him? I know this guy. Right. I remember we used to box together. Right. Yeah, he's the big killer around here. And after, whoa, and your mind starts getting blown to, whoa. Right, right. When you see these, these champions that I'm sure you adored and revered, like, you know, Guys that are still alive, the Ernie Shavers. Oh, the, absolutely. The Ken Nortons. Kwawe and all those guys. And, and even Frazier before he passed, like, these guys are fucked up. They're, they don't have, the, you know, like, Frazier, like, just no money and shit like that. No, see, Frazier had a, a circumstance with his daughter, with his family member. I think somebody in his family had took the property. He, I didn't understand the situation, but he, he did have money. He did? Yeah, but I guess he had some family dispute or something. Okay. All right, I'm here at I Am Rapport Stereo Podcast. Mike, I never in my life thought I would be able to interview you. You know, you just blew, blew my mind when you came here. You talked about Howard Houses and you told me about Jocko. Jocko did so much for Brownsville kids that had talent and stuff. Yeah, man. Lord Daniels, he helped all those guys out. I know. All those guys that were the streets would have ate up. I know, I know. And I mean, it's some of them, so many of my friends, you know, like that from that time when I was a kid, you know, in, in Brownsville, that you're like, that was such a good dude. And then, you know, two years later, like, you're like, he did what? Like, doing wild shit. Yeah, listen, that's your life. That's the lifestyle. And especially if you're in Brownsville, it's not hard to believe that a guy can have a, a problem with you and then something, you, you get your father involved and then the guy wound up killing you and your father. You yeah. know? I mean, it's just crazy what shit. It is. It's just crazy. Crazy shit. And, you know, not being like, I didn't grow up there and then being exposed to that shit at 12 years old like you're like you're still a kid but you're like what the f like i told you i would be i was out there i remember it clear as fucking day the sum the spring of 83 it was warm we were out in the streets playing ball every day we were fucking basketball dudes but gunshots would go off all the time and i would be like you know that's just a celebration they just celebrate they make some money they start shooting in the air some good stuff happens people are laughing at me because i'm like fucking like my spine is is ringing from the shit and, and young kids my age, 13, 14, are accustomed to that. In America, in New York City, in fucking Brooklyn. Yeah, that's just what it is. Crazy. Crazy. So, Listen, um, Billy the Kid came from Brooklyn, all right? Yeah. yeah. So we got a reputation of violence going so far back, you know? Right. 1700s. What, what do, you, do, you, do you get to spend time there now? Periodically, I go down there. I still have pigeon coops down there, so I go down there and fly pigeons down there. You still do that? Yeah. Who, who takes care of it? Um, my guy, Dave Malone. So that's real. That's not no bullshit. Like you still fuck with the pigeons. Yeah. Do you miss the pigeons in there? Because there's no, there's not pigeons in here in L.A., right? No, 
But I know people in LA that have pigeons. How, how do they, like they raise them or something? In their backyard, they fly the pigeons, they let them out, the bird fly, start doing their tumbling for and then come back down and go in. And they'll come back? Yeah. That's fucking crazy. Um, yo, have you, because I was thinking about like, how do, what, there's so many things I could ask you, Mike. Go for it. But when I was talking to you the other day on, on your podcast, Hot Boxing, with Mike Tyson, which is a dope ass name. Like I was just thinking, like all all the different like random things I was asking, about, but like just your your take on all the shit that's going on now. Like, have you been following this? Did you see this uh, Finding Neverland documentary? The Mike, yes, I did. The see Michael that. Jackson. I did see that. What did, what was your take on that? Mm, that's deep. You put me right on the spot. But listen, <laughs> it's wrong. It's wrong on both sides. You know, whatever happened when they were kids was wrong. But what he's doing now is even wrong. Coming out saying this stuff. And um, it comes across that these are guys just out to get some money. You know now. What I mean? Yeah, now. You know what Right. I mean? But um, you look at the situation. Who, listen, you have a young child, don't you? Yeah, well, they're 17, 19 now. Right. But yeah, I know. Say, say you have a 10-year-old, all right? Yeah. Well, you just take your 10-year-old and some guy say, what's your 10-year-old name? Julian. Hey, hey Michael, listen, um... I'm just feeling miserable, you know. I need Julian to come over here and make me feel better. I need to talk to Julian. And Julian makes me feel a lot better. Can Julian come and spend the week with me, please? Fuck I- no, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it is. Um, the parents have to be responsible for that shit. I, I agree. You know, I thought, of, and you you know, you've, you've been fucked. Oh, absolutely. You know, you've been fucked and, and, and people trying to take money and this, that, the other. And, you know, the Finding Neverland, for me, the documentary, and I thought about that in the parents. Like, let, let's say, let's just say, from, for instance, Michael Jackson. Let's say I'm so seduced by Michael Jackson, I let my kid go hang out with Michael Jackson. He still shouldn't be touched. So I'm an asshole for doing that. Yeah. But, like, the thing that was so disturbing about that movie was the details of it and, and the graphicness of it. And, and to me, it was less about Michael Jackson like that added a whole layer of complications. It was more about like the survivors of of molestation of 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 a trauma. You know what I mean? And and the the Michael Jackson thing and the how it happened is so unique and obscure. I just thought the fact that these kids, Michael is telling them that if anybody knows about this, we're gonna both go to prison forever. And um, it was just um, it was just it was just really horrible. You know, I have an eight year old kid. I wouldn't let Michael hang out with my kid. I want to let my kid go over to Michael's house. I love Michael. You know what I mean? Michael had um, had the reputation of this. It's like some people say, well, listen, you're Mike Tyson. I want to let my daughter around you because you've been to prison for rape. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And, I, and listen, I understand that. Right. I respect that. I understand that. Right. It's fucked up. I understand that because I would think the same thing. Right. Right. No, I you know hear I mean? you. I have my ignorance as well. Right. I hear you. Mm. Did you ever uh, come across Mike Jackson in your years? Yeah. You, what was your experience with Mike, Michael oh, Jackson? Mike, this nigga, I'm telling you something. Listen, Mike, I went to Cleveland. I'm with Don King, so we're on the plane. We get on the plane, so we drop down to Cleveland. So when Cleveland said, hey, Mike Jackson's playing in this stadium, so to speak, in Cleveland. So we go there, downtown Cleveland. We go there. And as soon as we come in the room, Don, Don King's tall, got big hair. You see him. We're walking down the aisle. Michael Jackson sees him, and he goes like this to Don King. And Don King goes like this. And so I'm with Don. Right behind, I go like this, too. And then Michael Jackson puts his hand down. And I'm saying to myself, now, that was just coincidence. He didn't put it down when I went up to diss me, and I'm sure he didn't do that. And so we're getting back. And so he's backstage. He's talking to Don. He doesn't say nothing to me. He's, and so everybody in his group, one guy gave me his fucking... His, drumsticks that played with Michael, hit the girl that sung with the blonde, she was talking about, I was able to get my autograph and pictures and stuff. But Michael just started chilling, he waited at a door, open door, he's waiting for a vehicle to pick him up, I realized later. Okay. And so he's just there like this, waiting for the vehicle, not talking to nobody. And I see him over there and I say, I, want, I better say, what's up to Mike, you know, because I'm going to do all this fucking with people, you know, my ego and stuff, but I'm not saying nothing to Mike, so I said, I'm going to go over there to Mike. And I go over there, I, I pull out my hand, I said, hey, Mike. And he turned around as soon as before, I said, hey, Mike. He said, do I know you from somewhere? Where do I know you from? I, I'm at the top of my game, man. I'm at the top, I'm at the top, I'm at the top of my game. I'm at the top of my game. And he said, where do I know you from? Do I know you from somewhere? You look familiar. Oh, shit. And I said, 
No, I'm nobody. Uh, I just a fan. I just want to say how he is. I couldn't even. Are fight. you fucking serious? Yeah, yeah. He crushed me right like that. That's bugged. From out. then on, this is like '87 or something. From then on, I hated this guy. I never talked to it. I said I don't fuck with Mike Jackson. Fuck Mike Jackson. This, that, Michael Jackson. Fuck. And this is the truth, right? And um, so it's um 2000 or something, right? And then um. But I've seen Michael some other times, but it's just not, you know, we took pictures all the time, but it's just like, you know, it's just boom. So he asked, one guy, Rodney Jurgens is his producer, he asked me to come down and Mike want to see. I said, no, nah, I don't fuck with Michael Jackson, brother. I don't fuck with him at all, brother. He said, no, nah, Mike asked for you to come down. I said, no, nah, get the fuck out of here. He said, Mike, I'm telling you, he asked for you. I said, man, I don't, f- f-. I said, okay, I'll come down. So I came down, right? And so... I'm there for like a while. I'm there for a couple of hours. So I'm walking around the house, the zoo and everything. At, at the Neverland? Yeah. And so it's nothing but kids around there. Nothing but a bunch of fucking kids. Like they, a bunch of them. They run the fucking joint, right? A bunch of kids, right? And so I'm walking around. So I see little Aaron. What's this little nigga? The, the singer. What's the singer there? Aaron Wait. Carter. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So I see Aaron Carter. And Aaron Carter's right there, right? And he's smoking a joint. He didn't even see me. And he's passing me the drink. So I'm smoking the drink with Aaron. And we're smoking in the house, chilling. And then somebody comes and gets me and said, Mike would like to see you now, right? So I go up there. And I'm in the end of this. I see fucking Michael, right? He's sitting out at the chair at the table. And he said, hey, Mike, how you doing, Mike? He said, hey, Mike, what's going on, man? Was, you know, he seemed very fragile. He was cool. And he said, um... What have you been doing? I said, I haven't been doing nothing. I've been resting. He said, rest is good. Rest is real good. Don't forget, rest is real good, right? And so we were talking about people we knew, and I'm talking about um, people in his family. We were talking, right? And so all of a sudden, we stopped talking, and we were just there for like an hour. We're not saying nothing to each other. And you're just in the room? Yeah. That's bizarre. Did you feel uncomfortable, or were you like, I'm just no. like taking this shit in? No, I was just taking it. It was cool. I understood it. It was beautiful, but it was just quiet. I got you. Ch- you know what I mean? We just chilling. That's bugged out. That's bugged out. Did his voice, was he talking that uh, that high-pitched shit, or was he like more no. like more like regular? Yes. You know, he had a, a soft voice, but it wasn't high-pitched. It wasn't that it was, extra yeah, shy yeah, fucking... No. He's very intelligent. He's, he's more intelligent than I anticipated. Yeah. Smart. Yeah. And... Um, might even be, I wasn't even a good one, maybe even devious. He was just very smart. He right. Was very sharp. Was he Was he a, a little guy? Oh, very frail. Thin. Very frail. I was at his house once, but he wasn't there. But I was in that house with the animals and the monkeys and yeah. all that shit. That's crazy, right? Crazy. His house was fucking nuts. That's all crazy. That- Did you have a bunch of kids there when you were there? It was just a few of us. It was uh, Damon Dash and... Jay Z, no, they were a bunch of kids, a like gang of fifty of them, ten, yeah. like oh, yeah. so it was like a tour or some shit. Yeah, no, they were running the joint. <laughs> so you know, a lot of that stuff you see about Michael, and you hear about Michael, and you say, "Well, he got all these motherfucking kids in his house for." Yeah, you know, you know I, I wouldn't let a bunch of kids in my house. You know, fuck I mess, no, I wouldn't. I don't let mess them. with kids like that. They get fun. I don't know the men, don't know their parents either. I don't let comfortable kids. You know, no, 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 no. no. I wouldn't do that. Either. I mean, the thing with Mike, I think is like. This is my takeaway from the fucking Finding Neverland, is you could be a lot of things and be something real bad. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I think, you know, like, there's somebody who thinks Jeffrey Dahmer, before he was Jeffrey Dahmer, was like, oh, yeah, it's cool. I see him at the coffee place. I never would have thought, you know what I'm saying? Not that it's the same, but I, I just think people are complicated, and I think that no, Michael... you just can't judge a person by what they say. You got to judge a person by their fucking actions. Right. Their character. Right. I ain't, you know, I, when people tell me I'm this kind, I don't believe nothing anybody tell me they are. Time, time will tell who you are. When did you start figuring that out? That's just, you know, you just figured it out a few years ago, but you just figured time's going to tell you who you are. Well, you, you know, I'm turning 49. That's awesome. But I think about how stupid I was in my 20s. Oh, man, listen, man. Can you imagine a guy like me in my 20s can throw away four or $500 million? Do you, do you, do you ever think about that? Huh? Specifically, not the money, but just like, the, like I, I think about my 20s and how dumb I was. Yeah, I do. I Dude, think what about, do you I, think? I didn't think I was going to live through my 20s. That's why I lived the way I did. Did you really, like, you really didn't think that? No way. No way in a million years. You know what I mean? Yeah. No way. Yeah. 
Yeah, back then, I thought, but you know, nowadays, like when I got in my 30s and stuff, I thought probably I would die from OD or something, but as my 20s, I thought somebody would kill me. I was disrespectful. I was rude to women, people's wives and stuff. I was one of those guys. Nobody could touch me. You crazy? I'm untouchable. I, I was stupid, Michael. Mm. I was just an idiot. I'm just so grateful. And, and I speak to people differently and talk to people differently and look at people differently and glad that God um, was merciful with my life and mm -hmm. saved, it saved me. I hear you. I hear you. Because I would kill me. You what? What do you? you would, if I, I would kill me if I if I disrespect me the way I disrespect me. I would kill me. The younger you, yeah. If it was if it was dealing, yeah. I see. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I think like you know, like the age, like it's like when you're young, you don't listen. You're, when you're young, you just see like what's in front of your fucking hand. You yeah. don't you don't fucking no, listen. I'm just so grateful. You you learn gratitude with age. Yeah, you know, my age, I learn gratitude. If you could do. I mean, there's because I'm not one of these people who like some some people the stock answer about regrets is I have none. If I wasn't, if I didn't have any regrets, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I'm like I have regrets from this morning. Oh man, I fuck the the, the first years of my life. I'm talking about today. Listen, we're gonna always have regrets, you know, because we're we're we're, we're uh, what you say? We just uh, we're work in progress, like people I learned years ago. We just we we say with something, we grow. At times we go, we're not what we were ten years ago. Fuck no, nor we should you be. A lot of, uh, one year ago, we just changed. People are we just work in process. I, I agree. I agree. I don't like that stock answer, that tough answer. Uh, I don't have any regrets. I wouldn't be the person I am. Motherfucker, like your fucking shit don't stink. Your shit yeah. stinks. Your shit stinks from, you know, you want to be better than the two days ago, than 20 years ago. Uh, I always think... Um, Sometimes, you know, and I don't say this in no respect. I love my wife, and I wouldn't give anything up for my family. I always think, what would have happened if I did that other move with her, with this girl? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and if that relationship, if it would have made that relationship yeah, work. Like, I go like this. That relationship looked better than this relationship that I have now. It just looks better. But I wonder how it would have, how would it would have blossomed out. I know what you mean. You know what I mean? Yeah. Crazy. I know exactly what you mean. Crazy. I know. I know exactly what you mean. But could, you know, they had a deal break. If something happened, they had a deal break, and I just couldn't do that. And so that's why I went with my wife. Isn't that crazy? I, I know exactly what you mean. It's crazy. Or sometimes you know, like you know, like you you go to shake someone's hand and like you miss it. Yeah. Sometimes, like in in the rhythm of getting along or not getting along, like you just you miss each other. It could be something as stupid as fucking with another chick or saying something at yeah. the wrong moment that ends the shit. It, it don't even have to be like, suck my dick, bitch. It could be something like, she needed you to say I love you or she needed you to something, something in that moment or I want to it, it, And it's not just with women, it's with relations, with, with dudes. Exactly. We were talking about that the, the last time I was talking to you about just the challenge of it is to just be friends with a guy. Yeah. You know, just to be to be friends. And you know, and know what the difference is? A woman has to understand. All women have to understand the relationship with two men. The, the difference that it is with a woman. A woman looks at a, our relationship as competition. A woman. Right. You know what I mean? I'm going to say from my experience, the women I date, they look at a close relationship with a man as competition. Is he fucking you? Is that your man or something, nigga? Why right. You why are you always with him? Why you can't do this with me? Why are you doing it with him? Right. You know what I mean? You know, it may take a while to come out, but when it gets heated, that's going to come out. In a, I know. In a black relationship, at least. I know, know exactly I mean? what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. And and it's... See, women can't, don't understand the relationship between two men. And they, nor should they. And no, just like this, like sometimes you see women communicate. I don't understand nothing with and, my and, wife. Even when she tells me, I don't understand it. I don't understand nothing about women. It's not for us. I don't understand relationships between women. I agree. So how I understand another relationship between another woman and another man. Right. I just, I have, it's just another planet for me. Another planet. Another I don't try planet. to figure this shit don't out. Don't try to figure it out. And it's like, we should all be treated equal, but we're different. A hundred percent. Men and women are different. Um, cultures are different. Um, age, we're different. Like, you know, you're not going to fuck with no, you ain't going to be hanging out with no, I mean, you might have friends, young dudes, 20, but at the end of the day, you're a grown man. No, listen. 
I'm not going to hang out with them. I may go to their concerts, support them, and also go backstage with them. But other than that, no, I'm not going to the after party with no. them. I'm not going to the hotel You're going with to you. sleep. Yeah, I'm going to bed. You're He's done. Got, We're I'm different. Done. They just get started. They just Keep rocking. Started. Yeah. I, I, you know, and, but like the, one of the things in the world today, like, you know, everybody's like, we're all the same and, and we're not embracing the differences. You, we should respect the differences. Oh, absolutely. But I know I can't hang with these kids no more. Fuck no. I can't, I can't out fuck this 22 year old girl. I know I can't. I want to. My, my ego tells me I can't, but I know from my experience, I can't. Especially not now. I know I can't. No, your, your best fucking behind you, no, Mike. No, but gone, baby. Gone. That's real, that's real talk. That's real talk. That's real talk. And man. who wants to fuck for an hour now? I, uh, yo, and when you're young, you don't have just. So, I ain't gonna give them an hour now. I got nothing. I, can't give, <laughs> I ain't giving them an hour now. They Your ain't best gonna, days are behind yeah, you. Yeah, they ain't gonna be talking about me like a dog. So I used to know I ain't doing it. No, I'm not doing it. <laughs> like that's <laughs> I. I it, it's just. It's that's good. wild, Mike. You put that. That fucks with me sometimes. In terms of what? I, I, my best fucking days are gone, It's gone, Mike. Mike. That fucks with me, Mike. Yeah, I know it's shallow. I'm talking shallow now, but that hit no. me in the spine. It's, it's real. Yeah, that means... I, Fuck I used, your best fighting I, days. I used, I used to think about I used to be so dick conscious. Yeah, but when my fighting days were over, I still had my dick. Ah, oh, nigga. Mike. Now, that's not even funny, though, really. Mike. That's just not funny. But, you know, you can catch a flashback yeah. every now and then. But it's just so far and in between, Mike. <laughs> Fuck, nigga. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Sometimes I'm just like, I know what you mean. Sometimes I'm just like, fuck oh, it. You know, like, it's it just, it's just too, it's just like you're out of breath and it's like, what, am I working yeah. out here? Like, this is not supposed to be something like, you know, it's not like climbing the stairs. This is supposed to be easy. But when you get old, like, it's, it takes you its toll. You got to work on it and shit. You got to wait and think 30 shit now, right? <laughs> oh, fuck. My that's mind a chill, wanders. That's a woman, baby. Woman, baby. Chill, 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 baby. Chill, chill. <laughs> Fuck, that yeah. shit's funny. Has anyone ever done a thing with you? Like when I, when I just threw out Michael Jackson and even like your stories, the, the amount of people that you've come in contact with. You remember that thing on, on Dave Chappelle, Char, the late, great Charlie Murphy? Oh, who I'm Charlie in? was awesome, man. He was a good Brooklyn oh, listen, dude. Man, I can't even tell you some Charlie Murphy stories. Man. You can't even tell him. I any. can't even tell you that, man. Eddie had a heart attack, man. <laughs> you had to, you rock with Charlie. Oh, man. Oh, Charlie's off the hook. Charlie's the realest cat, right? When he brings his gangster game, you know? It, the best you know, shit. Like, oh, you saw his gangster game? Yeah. Oh, man. And he would talk that shit. Oh, man. Oh, man. But he, he did that thing on Chappelle, uh, Charlie Murphy, True Stories. They should do, like, where you just, all the people you've met over the years, like the Michael Jackson, the fucking Princess Diane is yeah, like. The stuff Charlie did was, oh, Charlie's mad, man, man. Charlie was an awesome guy. He's a good dude. And oh, see, awesome he was so guy. Brooklyn, like, the way he spoke Real with serious, all these motherfuckers. Yeah. Man, fuck them niggas. They ain't no bullshit ass nigga. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Motherfuck Charlie. Mike, fuck yeah, Tyson. Motherfucker. And he looked, and it was bizarre because he looked just like. Fucking Eddie Murphy, but he sounded like Charlie Murphy. And Eddie's just a mild metal guy. I don't want no trouble and shit. Charlie talking shit. Yeah, talking crazy shit. Um, let me throw other names at you. People you've met. Okay. Yeah, because you've met everybody. Madonna. Did you meet Madonna? Yeah, I met Madonna. In the yeah. in the heyday. Yeah, my heyday. Right after I knocked out Sphinx. Right the day after, two days after that, we went out to saw Pee Wee's Big Top, Pee Wee Great Adventure, and shit. Me, her, my wife, and Sean Pitt. Oh shit, that's crazy. What was she like? What was Sean Penn like back then? We were me and Sean was both drunk. We fell passed out in the movie theater, but um, you know, she was just special. You know, you and Sean Penn got drunk watching Pee Wee's. We passed out in the movie theater. That's fucking dope. What about explain your relationship with Trump in regards to boxing in Yo, your listen, time, right? Trump was the baddest guy. He gave me the most money to come. I used to, well, I was just came on the scene. And so I was boxing maybe a couple of fights in Atlantic City, a couple in Vegas. And then Trump just put it there, boom, I'm going to give you what is 11,000, 11 million, 12 million, whatever it is you fight at my place for a certain amount of fights. And so I, I, I started fighting in Trump Towers. And that's how I fought around, what, 10, 12 times there. And then um, Vegas became the place to go. And so the big contracts were in Vegas, so we went to Vegas. That all like the Leon Spinks fight was there. I mean, the Michael Spinks and fight in Atlantic City. That was in Atlantic City. Larry Holmes, Atlantic City. 
Larry Holmes was in Atlantic City. Did you, what, what is your memory of, of him? Like, because I tell people, like, as a New Yorker, we saw him all over the fucking place. Yeah. He's, He's like just, a New York shit talking dude. He just, yeah, exactly. It's a guy um, believes in a New York City ego. Typical New York guy. You know what I mean? A lot of people always talk shit about him. He had his enemies and stuff. He grind from the streets. His father gave him, what, I don't know, 11 million? I don't know how many, a couple of millions for him to run his empire. And he made, um, he went bankrupt. He right. fucked up. He made a comeback. You know what I mean? Right. And he grind. You know, it wasn't like, you know, he had money. His father gave him money. His corporations went out of business. And he, he made a comeback. And after that, he didn't became president. He didn't even plan. He didn't anticipate winning. He, this was for his books and for his... Whatever his other business for, you know, I mean, he could get a following for his business. And this is a, a business scheme or something. Then he became president. What is your take of, of him now? Knowing him, being a grown man now, and like just the craziness of the fucking where we are right now. What is Yo, your take listen, on it? Right? I don't like the way this stuff is going, right? But um, I like Donald Trump, you know? Donald Trump stood up for me when I was talking, when they talked bad about me. And the people said, what do you think about this convicted rapist that he was for you? He, you know, he responded and he said, I'm a tie. He accepted my, um, you know what I mean, vouching for it. He accepted that and said, Mike is my friend. And, and, I, and I respected that. Mm-hmm. It's hard, it's hard not to. And I couldn't, I, I listened. Um, and he said things and people went against him and black people went against him. And and I was, and I understand that too. Some of the things that went on and why they were upset, all the stuff Charlottesville and everything. But listen, you look at a guy like me, where I came from, all the felons I got. This guy's a president. Um, he's a, he's a nominee. He's just he's just a uh, campaign. He's not president yet, but he's just campaigning. He he says all these you know cool things. I like Mike Tyson. He likes me. We're both t- you know it's good stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's campaign. And then um, what am I going to say? Fuck him. He's a racist pig. You know, I can't find myself to say that. I right. can't say that. Right. I can't say that. Right. I'm not going to be one of those guys to say that. Right. And if people are like, well, Mike is fucking bugging. Mike's just saying. Like- I can't say that. I can't. I can't. I can't listen. A lot of my people from my community turns against me, against the attorney, back on me from my, my rape conviction. I don't want to hear that shit. Come on. I'm just keeping it real with you. Nah, I hear you. That, Mike, you're so fucking genuine. I don't want to hear you. That's the, I, and somebody told say, no, I'm with Mike Tyson. He's running for his presidency. He didn't say, fuck him now. I don't believe I don't want no racist the uh, campaign for me. He could have easily said that. Right. Right. He talked to me about reverencing me. So I said, fuck, I ain't gonna say nothing disrespectful about him. He never said anything he said was beautiful things about me. So what do I do? You know, people in my family don't like him. Say I should say, what do I do? You tell me, Mike. I'm on your show now. <laughs> no, really, really. Tell me, Mike. You know, I think what, my, what you should do, Mike, is just what you just said, straight up. Because it's, I mean, obviously we're not talking about, like we mentioned people that have done really horrible, horrible things earlier. And your experience from him is different. And as much as I can't stand this cocksucker, this is me as, as the president. Because before he was just... Donald Trump, I see him at the parties and shit like that. It's complicated, man. I was hoping he said something disrespectful about me. I could could deal with that, but I can't deal with him saying something nice and I think something that's disrespectful about him or against him. And knowing your personal experiences is... Yeah, I can't do that. I'm the Tom then. If that's the Tom, I'm the fucking Tom. Right. I got you. Do you feel like, because you're, you're so uh, beloved in regards to the streets in the hood, keeping it real, like all the shit you've been through, and then with the Trump, it's like, you know, do, do you feel conflicted about that? No, but if that's the reason why they like me, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm keeping it real with him. Right. I'm keeping it real with him. Right. I'm going to say all this good stuff he said. I, I need the good stuff he said about it. And all this good stuff he said about this is a president candidate. And now he's president. He said beautiful things about me. I respect that. And you were the brunt of jokes. Yeah. You were the one I like. I respect that. There, I there respect was, that. It, you, it was like, you know, you were cast away by everybody. Exactly. Can you imagine point. his cabinet? Imagine what the people, the Republicans said. What are you talking about? They probably said, what are you talking about? You want to fuck this up? Saying right. he's your friend? This rapist is your friend? Right. Right. I think that beyond the ass kicking, 
the thing that ignites so much good feelings in people with you, Mike, is because of, it's like, you know, the movie Raging Bull. Now, he, he was extreme, and that's a movie. You know, some of it's real, some of it's not. But that is my favorite movie. Mine's too. Why is it your favorite movie? Because um, that's dealing with a fighter. He's dealing with all the fighters, with the fighter for his, all his insecurity. Because that's all the that's all the raging bull was an insecure motherfucker. Everybody's fucking his wife. Everybody's talking about him. He didn't feel good. He's fat motherfucker. He doesn't want to train. He's depressed now. You know what I mean? Those are insecurities. You gotta break his ass to lose that fucking weight. You know what I mean? He's not a regular 130, so he, he's always 30, 40 pounds over, so he got to die to lose his fucking weight. You know what I mean? So he's mad at every fucking body. See, if you were to fight, you would know losing that weight, cutting that weight makes a motherfucker mean. It does, huh? Yeah. It just keeps they, you on edge, right? Show you that, they, they did show you that part. Right. They did, but they don't show you that in real. But they don't show you that in Rocky, do they? No. They don't show you that in the real deal. In terms how about, of just how about for attitude girl turned into a little bit of a savage when you gotta lose that weight and it's killing him. Can't eat anything, can't gotta watch your water. You know what I mean? Got spit, can't even swallow your spit. Well, you hear what I'm saying? Can't even swallow your spit. Everything, <clears throat> spitting every all day. That makes sense. In terms of fighter and also this movie and the brilliance of that movie and the brilliance of that performance, just speaking of the movie, um, because, you know, when I've dieted and you can't do this or whatever, it, it, you know, it ain't, it's not necessarily, it ain't fun to be no, around. It's not good stuff at all. Especially when you're fucking rich and successful and like. Yeah, why do I got to do this? And that's what happens with rich, successful people that were great athletes. Or great. That's why I got to do this shit? I don't have to do that. I'm rich now. Why I got to do this shit? Fuck this. I made it. Yeah, I want to eat. No, and that's what they say. That's what they say. The thing about Raging Bull that I like is there's. And this is why I, I equate that film. If if they make that movie that they've been talking about with you with Scorsese and Jamie Foxx, or I mean, he might be too old now, but if they make that movie, the thing about you and no, they'll play Jamie at another stage of my life. As a, as a go, man, they have different actors at different stages of my life. Yeah. I think that's how they're going to do it. I, it would, I don't uh, want to give out. The, I don't, don't want to give it away. But right. I, think, I don't know. I, I got don't you because he can't I play sixteen year old. Yeah, Mike I don't now. know. He's a great actor, but he still can't know. do that. But but no, we do now. They have the thing that they use for Benjamin Button. They use that now. That's, they de-age yeah, a motherfucker. Yeah, they use that now. Which is crazy. They do that now. They make you go back to being 20 and shit. Yeah, they can do that. But the thing about you, obviously Raging Bull's a movie, it ends, but there was redemption, little bit of redemption. He forgave himself at the end of that movie. No, that was the biggest redemption. You can't get any other redemption if you don't forgive yourself. <laughs> I have to forgive myself. You can't continue to go on. Like sometimes um, I might think sometimes that I'm really a savage sometimes. And some people might not deserve to have um, a peaceful existence because I think so. They don't deserve that because they piss me off. It's just a reason. And they have some reason I think they don't deserve that. Still you'll have that. No, it may pop up every now and then. Uh -huh. And I have to um, calm down and say I'm not a fucking savage. You know, I'm a loving father. I'm a husband. I, no, I, Mike, I have to remind myself. That's how fucked up I was. That's how far back I was deep into the savage, the animal. I have to succeed because of my insecurity. I can't succeed unless I'm a savage. I can't do it normally because I'm inequipped. So I have to be an animal to do it. I can't do it respectfully or honorably. I respect that, Mike. No, that's just real. It, it is. I get it. I get it. And, and I think that hearing you talk like that, I spoke about this before, you know, you humbled me when I started seeing you come to the other side of your stuff and your play. Like, it, it had an effect on me as someone who was a fan of you, who would, you know, everybody, you inspired everybody to fuck some shit up and, you know, that Brownsville shit, yo, fuck you talking about. And, you know, just that attitude. Like, I brought that into my auditioning. Now, I'm not physically fighting, but that I'm in the, fuck you, I'm getting this part, suck my fucking dick. Exactly. Different sport. But that attitude that, that big mouth, shit talking, disrespectful, unfaithful fucking boyfriend, unfaithful oh, husband. It's a pick. But to see you go on the other side of it, it inspired me. Oh, Mike, and listen, right? I'm so grateful I don't got fucking AIDS. When you said that I'm great, faithful boyfriend shit, nigga, Mike, I used to get these fucking diseases, Mike. Fuck, I'm just always so grateful I never. I used to go to my fights, dick, right? With my fights. And you know, we have to take the blood test and the AIDS test. I used to say, I don't want to take the blood test. 
I'm not gonna fight if I have to take the blood test. I don't want to take the blood. And Mike said, Mike, you gotta fucking take the blood test. Everybody take it. What the fuck are you talking about? You gotta take the blood test. I said, I'm not taking the fucking blood. Cause I always thought I was caught, caught, so I'm fucking dying. Cause I'm always fucking, fucking these people raw. Also, I listen. I was in Jamaica. You know there's nothing but fucking disease, fuss and shit. And I had a rubber. My rubber fucking busted. And I'm being this bitch. Both look at each other. And said, fuck. We both looked at each other like, oh no. I hope she started crying. My face was like. Fuck! And when she started crying, I thought she had the shit. And my mind started playing games with me. I said, fuck! Oh no! Fuck! And then still, I should have been scared straight. I left there and went to Cuba and found somebody else and fucked somebody else in the fucking without a rubber. I said, oh no, I'm gonna die. Mike, that's bugged the fuck. And no. they're thinking you don't want to do the blood test because you're on steroids or some drugs. No, because they got AIDS or some bloody <laughs> disease or something. Because you're a fucking... Yo, that's oh, crazy. Man. That's crazy. And the guy called so he took my blood test and everything. He came back and said, you're good. I said, no, I'm not. I said, no fucking way. I'm good. I lost all that fucking weight in a few days. No fucking way. I had got food poisoning and... and Fucking Cuba, and I started throwing up violently. And all of a sudden, I was a little chubby, and I lost weight. And this girl had said to me that I left in Jamaica when I went to Cuba, and I came back. And she said, um, Mike, you don't even train, and you still look good. And I said, fuck. You got nervous. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> said, you don't even train, and your body still look good. And I said, fuck. I was just a fat fuck a few days ago when I was in Cuba. And I'm saying, fuck, but I was throwing up violent. And you I, fucked and the weight off. No, I threw it up. It's like sick. I was throwing it up. Fuck. And I said, please test me. And when I got tested by private doctors, you okay? I said, no, doctor, I'm not okay. I don't feel right, doctor. This ain't right. You're not taking the blood test right. I was fucked up, Mike. I used to always get fucked up. Damn. And I always said, I'm never going to do it again. As soon as the fucking fight over, right back to them fucking sluts, man. Yeah, you, can't, you can't help it. I would be catching People a plane. People get the I fame. I catching a plane at the airport. The airplane delayed. Boom, I get the fucking students. We go into the bathroom. We're fucking in the bathroom. We're in an airplane in like Ohio somewhere. We don't know. She doesn't know I'm Mike Tyson. She's going crazy. And boom, we're in the bathroom. I hear you. You know what I mean? I, I hear you. There's no fucking, didn't know her name, just knew her, started kissing her, and we're in the fucking bathroom. <laughs> And so this became normal. This kind of lifestyle became normal to me. And stuff. And so I don't know how to live a life with my family now. So next time I'm, I'm with my wives, I'm fucking still living that life. My wives are getting fucking burned. I'm burning the fuck out of my wives and shit. They fucking leave me. They can't deal with scared they're going to die and kill a kid or whatever's going to happen. And um, I don't even know how to stop living that life. I fucking hear you. I can't even imagine how I stopped living. That's all my life. Just wanted to fuck. Just wanted to, to dominate somebody. Wanted to make them believe they love me. Or I love them. It's all sick in my head. It had nothing to do with me wanting to fuck them. It had, I wanted them to love me and take care. It's sick. It was I'm a sick fuck, Mike. It was sick. I wanted somebody to love me, so I wanted to fucking fuck the shit out of them or something. And I'm thinking that's going to make them love me and give them money and shit and fuck them up in the ass. They do all kind of fucking shit, and so this is going to make them love me because I'm the man. Right. I was just so um, disillusioned, Mike. I hear you. My whole life was a lie. Everything I thought was, everything I did and thought that made me who I wasn't successful, all that was a lie. You know? What do you do to keep tabs on yourself to keep you straight, safe, and function on the, on the right path now? I just know my slot. My slot is my family. My wife, my kids. You love your wife. My other kids. Yeah, that's my... Listen, I can't even say my best friend. We are just... Um, that's my creator. We, just, we, we accomplished <laughs> so much just from a, a family perspective. Mm -hmm. You have to think our first year, we almost killed each other physically. Our first year. Just driving each other fucking... First year, I thought I would hurt her or something. I'd kill her. Or it was just incredible. I can't believe we're in love, madly in love now. That's fucking crazy. Can't even believe it's it. awesome, though. Can't even believe it. You were driving her fucking nuts. She was driving me nuts, too. We, but we were never used to living with somebody... For, so I, I had marriages, but my, listen, I had one marriage. My wife lived in, in Potomac, Maryland. I lived in Vegas. All right, that's how it was. Come visit me. I come visit you. A holiday and stuff. But this is where we live. Right. What kind of fucking life is that? Right. You know what I mean? That's just my whole, all my marriages are just a trip. This is the first time I lived with someone. Look, I've been married for 10 years. That's unheard of. I was married for seven years before, but they never saw me. Right. I had a couple of kids. It was like you, you know, were dating. Yeah, I had a couple of kids during that marriage, too, because we're never around. So I'm hitting other people, getting other people pregnant. So I'm having kids and stuff. It's, not like, it's like we're not even married, only when we see each other. But other than that, 
part of the year, I'm not seeing each other. Or at fights or something. We're not married. It's just sick. Being married is... A, is that's what I have regret for. I'm hurting so many people's feelings, not caring. It's when they get be stimulated and then not care about what anybody else wanted. Right. I, I hear you. It's a... Uh, I mean, life is a motherfucker. Relationships are a motherfucker. Yeah. It's all about knowing what I realize, and I'm not an expert, but I, I realize it's all about compromising. If I want... What's going to be... Am I going to be right... <laughs> or am I gonna lose this relationship? And it ain't a fight. It ain't. A, yeah. It ain't. A, there's not a winner or a loser. Yeah. So I said I'd rather just be wrong. I don't want to be right because if I'm right, this is gonna be fucked up. Since the relationship is gonna be fucked up, I said I'm right. wrong. Right. Yeah, I'm wrong. I always dude. say there's. It ain't boxing. It ain't no. tennis. It ain't football. Because if we start arguing about who's right, fuck you, fuck you, oh, you man. cocksucker, you prick. Go back to that wa- nigga you was with last. What was happened to your boyfriend? Who's that nigga you was with before you was with me? That bitch, that nigga. Oh, man, it gets crazy. We go back to the old boyfriend and girlfriend. Oh, motherfucker. Mike, we're talking about our old fuck, our old girlfriend and boyfriend. And that's when it's getting creepy. That's how real insecurity is just to Terrible. Say. Yeah. Go back to that nigga. Go back to that other. You know, well, go back to that other bitch that you were with before right. me. Oh, fuck. Talk, oh, shit. Just didn't know how to handle relationships, Mike. It's really savage shit, man. Not good. Savage shit. <clears throat> um, let me throw more shit. Mm-hmm. And as far as boxing, when you look at your opponents now, was there ones that you? I know, like you, you've come on the other side with Evander and and different people. You you know Lennox. Was there ones that you clearly like? Definitely like I don't like this motherfucker. No, um, well, Mitch Green. I didn't listen. As time grew, I realized who I am now. I really didn't dislike Mitch Green, you know what I mean? I was just insecure. Mitch Green rubbed me the wrong way. He rubbed me from a street perspective. He challenged my fucking street manhood. He knew how to touch me. These other guys didn't know how to touch me like this slumbag. He's a real street urchin. This guy knew how to fucking get to me. And that's why me and Mitch Green didn't have a good, I'm falling out. The other opponents, the, the majority of them? Nah, the rest of them, nah. I, I have no beef with them. I love them when I see them. If I have some money and they're fucked up, I break them off. And how soon after did it? does it take, like, because I'm not a boxer, obviously. Like, does it take from going to, like, I'm going to fuck this dude up in a boxing ring to where it comes to go, like, we're people, we're competitors, we're athletes. Do you know when it's I mean? over. When it's over. You respect that person. Yeah, when it's over. But when we're doing the, going through the process, it's all out war. I want to kill your fucking mother. That's just the way it is. Were you really pissed with Larry Holmes, the way he was sort of seemed like he was disrespecting you at that time? No. I have mad deal respect for Larry Holmes. Always did. But um, in order for me to be successful in what I do, me, I have to dehumanize you. I can't look at you as a person. Then I'm then I'm weak again. Then this I ain't have, ballet. I have, I have sympathy for you as you're a person. I have to look at you as a lifeless piece of shit. You're nothing. You're worthless. Your life is worthless. In order for me to perform the way I need to perform. I got you. I mean, I think that the majority of fighters have that, even if they don't articulate it as truthfully as you articulate it. I think it, it doesn't seem normal to be able to... You know, Pacquiao seems like he's all sweet and shit, but when he gets in there, he's yeah. not sweet he's and not shit. He's not sweet at all. He's a fucking animal. He's a fucking beast, right? He, when, That's the way you should be. And when that motherfucker, the thing about Pacquiao, you know, and you could break, break it down just as a boxing dude, you hit him, he's fighting. No, you're in a fight with him. You're in a fight with him. He's a great fighter. You can't take that away from him. That's a natural instinct in Manny, Manny Packer that you can't teach. You punch me, I'm going to punch you back well, you five know, Manny, times. Manny's the animal. He came from God. You know you see where he <laughs> come from? Makes Browns look like yeah, fucking Disneyland. Ridiculous. And it's just government. Shouldn't, people shouldn't be allowed to live like that. That's the real stuff. That's the government. People shouldn't, human beings shouldn't live like animals. That's like an animal. People shouldn't live like that. It's, not, it's just inhumane. They should not do it. Government should not have ghettos. Not like that. We shouldn't have ghettos like that. Browns and all that shit. We should not have that stuff. That's unhumane. You cannot live a normal function in life. You can't grow. You. It's just very. It's difficult. Let me throw other. Let me say, just as a fighter, his career. Uh, you know, he broke my heart beating Ali. Talk about Holmes as a fighter. What made him great? Splendid fighter. Um, great left jab. But what made him more special than anything was the intestinal fortitude. He was tough as nails. Knock down, get back up, and fight you to death. You know what I mean? And he got that from Ali. He was Ali's sparring partner. See, Ali, this is the only thing about Ali. When you were watching Ali get beaten up as an old man, even though he was a young kid, he's not going to quit. You got to kill him. He won't quit. 
Even he's, he was getting beat up every round, getting the shit kicked out of him by Larry Holmes. And it's a champ, no, come on, let me out, come on out. They wouldn't stop. He had to be, he would have to stay up there and just take the beating like a man. He just, he wouldn't quit. Um, in a way, I respect the guy like that so much. I have so much admiration for a guy like that so much, but it's just not right to do you that way as a human being. Just say it's over. I'll come back and fight another day else. You got me. You know? And listen, um, I always like to think I'm a bad motherfucker, vicious motherfucker. I'm a, I don't give a fuck, but um, that's a part of Ali. That's, that's where he overshines me because I can't understand a man that's willing to just really die for this. You know, and I talk that shit, but he, he's the real dick. No. Why does it make you emotional? Is it talking about him or the relation to you? Um, me, fuck me. Um, Ali's a giant. I, no, there's no way other fighters can match him. He'll die for this shit. He'll die. I'm not gonna die for this. Mike, you're such a good dude. That's real talk. He's a savage. He's an animal. He's a different breed of person. He's not like us. You're a good guy, Mike. You're a good fucking dude. No, fuck that. It's just real talk. I know, but you're just such a. You're a good dude, man. You're you're such a good dude. I see that in you. You do. Fuck yeah. Cool. <laughs> cool. Um. Let me throw another couple of boxers at you, just for your, your take on it. Some of the guys that I loved. Aaron Pryor. Fuck. Animal, man. What the hell happened to this guy? Listen, that's another guy we're going to talk about fighters that really fell on hard times. Listen, right? <sighs> I'm telling you, the first time I ever saw this guy, he made me cry. I saw him. Um, In Vegas? No, he was fucking, um, I was a little kid, like 14 years oh, old. Oh. He was fighting this guy, Leonardo Ospreay or something. He, a tough guy from South America, right? And he was saying, he was shadow boxing. He was saying, no more welfare for me. And he was crying. Damn. I said, who the hell is this guy? And man, when I saw him fighting for like an animal for fifth, 10 rounds, nonstop. And then the guy was an animal too. 10th round, last round, he knocked the guy cold. And that's how he was living his fight, knocking these guys out. What he did more than anything, more than knocking them out, he wore them down. He nonstop perpetual motion. He brought him down, moving, slipping side to side, hitting him. He was an incredible fighter. Wore you down. He didn't look pretty, but he did pretty work. Pretty work. Yeah, his fighting style didn't look pretty, but he whipped your ass. It's awkward. It's hard to hit him. Yeah, and he was throwing punches, yeah. all kind of shit. Yeah, he was a great fighter. Yes, the drugs beat him. Right. He never been beat by a fight. Only drugs beat him. You talk about uh, Duran. Ah. Uh, was he one of your favorites? My hero. Listen, um, I remember when I, was, I was just started boxing in 1979, 19, and then 1980, he fought Sugar Ray Leonard, right? And listen, so cussing everybody, we were Duran's side. We were all on Duran's side because he was coming up in weight, fighting the great Olympic champion, welterweight champion, just knocked out the great Wilfredo Benitez, master defense fighter. And so... Um, it's time for him to fight the Rand. So he had a couple defenses. He knocked the guys out. The Rand had a couple defenses. And the fight was built to such a crescendo pace. I didn't know what to do. When they were fight, I was, I was excited. I, was, I didn't know. My heart was beating. And after that fight, right, it was such a massive fight. These guys fought for 15 fucking rounds. None of them had a mark on their face. And they fought like warriors, fighting, throwing punches at each other, trying to kill them, and moving. Awesome, massive movement, boxing, all incredible, all short range, close. Man, Throwing punches at their hardest and they can't hit each other. They're moving and it was just brilliant, man. Brilliant. It's incredible. You're, you're not gonna see that kind of stuff no more. Guys so close to each other, throwing punches, trying to kill each other, just missing and coming back. Oh man, two masters fighting. Shit. Turned me out. That turned me out for fight. It turned me the fuck out. You loved it. Yeah, I went running right after that. It turned me out. What about Sugar Ray as a fighter? Oh, he awesome. had a fucking ball. Oh, man, when it came down to it, man, he, he fought. He came down the last minute of You're it. You're blowing man. it, kid. Oh, man, he came down. He tried him all oh, Tommy Hearns. God damn, Tommy Hearns was beating his ass. I was watching that fight. I was a young kid. He closed his eye, and he just <laughs> dug deep inside. And just, but he has kept punching until Tommy went down. He, he had that punching. fucking heart. He was an animal, man. A pretty motherfucker had that fucking yeah, heart. Yeah, he was a fucking animal, man. Um, he was an animal. The, uh, talk about the real, uh, not the character, 
the real Jake LaMotta as a boxer. Awesome fighter. Had about 100 fights, probably 98, 100 fights and stuff for everybody. Then nobody, he didn't duck nobody for everyone. With these fucking guys. He had to throw a fight to get a chance to fight for the title. Right. You know? The mob owned fight and he didn't like the mob, didn't hang around the mob, but all his brother hung around him and he had friends, they lived in his building, but he didn't want to associate, he wanted to do it on his own, but he couldn't. He had to give in to them. So he had to throw a fight in order to get a chance to fight for the title. And do, when you look back on these guys, who are like, they'll fight uh, uh, March 1st and then fight again March 28th? Yes. That's what I did. I fought 15 times in one year. When you were young? Yes. That's the way, is that good or bad? That's or beautiful. Harry Grab fought 35 times in one year. Damn. One year, 35 times. It keeps you in shape. It keeps you sharp. Yes, you never have to really be in the gym because you're fighting so often. You never get a chance to really go to the gym and train. Do you think like boxing now, like Wilder and Fury had a good fight? Yes. And then now we're like, okay, we got to run it back. Was it a draw? Was it First of all, who did you think won that fight? Um, listen, right? Um, I like um, Tyson Fury, right? For, um, the other guy might have won the fight. You know what I mean? I'm a Tyson Fury guy, but the other guy might have won the fight. He got the two knockdowns. It's hard to come Close. back from two fucking knockdowns. Right. You know, you know how hard it is for in a 15 round fight to come back from two nights down? And this is the 12 round fight. He had to listen. After being knocked down twice, he had to win every fucking round since then. He had to win every round to win. After being knocked down twice, you have to win every damn round in order to. And I don't know if he did. I agree. You know? That's I tough. Agree. I like, I want Tyson to win. I want him to beat everybody. But I agree. Shit. That's just the, me talking as a fight yeah. guy. Does it frustrate you? And maybe you could explain this. So they got busy. Whether it's a draw or not draw, we don't know. You're stupid. I'm stupid. Tyson won. Um, F uh, F Deontay won. Doesn't matter. Let's throw down three months from now. Dude, yeah. And it won't happen. Exactly. Right? Listen, right? You're talking about three months. Sugar Ray Robinson fought for the title and fight you back three weeks later. Well, why does this <laughs> happen, back, though, you know, Mike? I have to be have kicked by Jake Lamada. Fight him back again three weeks later fighting Jake Lamada. Not just the guy fighting Jake Lamada. A guy almost killed him. Jake. Who yeah. never doesn't go down. Yeah, yeah, for six times. So what is this shit, though? Like, this is why, as a fan, I'm like, what the fuck? This is what happens. This is what happens. And this is the heavyweight division. Listen, if you beat my fighter, and you, listen, this is what I did with Don King. Don King, at first, to make it, I had to fight all Don King fights, so he's getting paid from both of us. That's what you do illegal Double anyway, dipping. right? So anyway, why would Don let me fight all of his fighters if I'm not going to be with him? Suppose I said, well, I'm finished. I don't want to do business with him. So I don't beat him, put him out of business now. Now he got to start back over. See, that's the problem. Now, if he puts them out of business, he has a team. So he puts them out of business. Now he got to start from scratch. I understand. In terms of getting new guys. Yeah. And Don and his fighter won't be good product just for guys, up and coming guys, after you get beat. You know what I mean? Right. Your, pro, your, your market value goes down. Right. Unless you're a superstar, then your, your market value always going to be up, even if you lose. But so, so is it specifically with these guys, they had a great fight. It's British guy, it's American guy, white guy, black guy. They they fought to a draw or not a draw, whatever the fuck it was. And I got, they were going to fight, then they're not going to... I don't get... Normally, well, now we did... What did we do? We did that in America, right? Yeah. The last fight. Now we're going to take it over to England. Right. That's in only right. In the Wembley. Right. That's only right. That's only right. And there's a lot of money to be made More over money here. than over here. For, for Wembley Stadium, yeah. Yeah. More ticket sales. They have more ticket sales. Big time. All right. Listen, Mike... It's uh, the Iron Mike Tyson, I Am Rap Poor Stereo Podcast. I told you this. My style is impregnable. Um, my, my skills listen, are was, impenetrable. Listen, dig, right? Let me tell you something. You know a guy like me? I used, to, um, I used to read a lot about Alexander the Great, right? And I used to be like a worshiper of him. This guy's dead thousands of years ago and stuff. I'm worshiping. I'm reading his fucking, I'm reading his um, accomplishments, Right? I'm reading this guy's accomplishments and his personality and all that stuff, and I used to be that kind of way. And that's when everybody despised me because I used to know what I read it. I'm looking at something today because um, he did what no gladiator did before his time. When he came to battle, he had his burgundy, his purple robe, and his cape and stuff, but he was beautiful. His hair was in place. He had perfume cologne all over him. And everybody looked, what the fuck is wrong with him? Why is he smelling like that? You know, it was just that you had to be glory and full. You had to be glorious in battle. 
You know what I mean? Everything was in with a super megalomania, egotistical perspective, you know? So when you were talking that much- Oh, nigga, I used to be a megalomania. I used to think I was a god. Fuck, those, those guys, they were gods. They didn't know what else. A lot of things I didn't know. When I, when I thought they went on their campaigns, I thought they were just had armies, they had men, and we just walking a thousand, ten thousand miles to get to this other empire and conquer them. No. They had parties. They had like uh, 100,000, 50,000 people. They had women, party, drinks, drugs, everything. This is a party. We're going we're gonna to probably walk 1,000, 10,000 miles, but we're going to do it in a party. And as we go, we just going to collect everything. We're going to conquer everything, collect everything, pick up their custom, their, their cultures and everything. It's party constantly. But it was a big party because they, they, they believed they were going to die, so they were going to die glorious. Right. It was a party. I had no dream. It was a party. It wasn't no, we're going to conquer. Right. It was a party. It was a big party that they conquered everybody. Sometimes they were so ferocious and the people saw how they were living so beautiful, they just gave in. So, yeah, we, you don't have to fight. We just want to join. <laughs> just, just, just fuck you know, it. I'm serious. Real talk. I never knew that. I thought it was just about the soldiers marching and marching hardcore. No, they had bitches. They had every party. They were doing drugs. They were drinking. It was a party when they were conquering everything. I thought it was hardcore. We're going to kill these motherfuckers and everybody's going to die. No, it was beautiful. They believed they were going to die and they were going to die. We were going to have a great time dying. We're going to go out yeah. on top. Yeah. Mike. Fucking Iron Mike Tyson. I can't believe I got to interview you, Mike. Yeah, no, but it's good stuff. You're a good guy. You know, I mean, most guys are not good people. They just want to get some ratings on their numbers, on their stuff, you know. I've been a fan of yours. You've inspired me. Beyond, I was never a boxer. Who you are as a person inspired me when I was a kid. Mike, I literally would walk into auditions thinking about you. Really? Listen, man. I swear to God, Mike. Like, I have to, like, fuck these guys. You know, it's like, it's auditioning, but I had that, that Brownsville Mike Tyson. You could suck my dick. And then... All that stuff and all, all the good, the bad, and all the stuff. But, but right now, like man to man, like you're you coming out on the other side of stuff, it inspires me, Mike. This is what my mentor Cuss says, right? You know what I mean? You can be a nice guy, but this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna conquer everybody. We're gonna kick everybody, we're gonna conquer everybody. And then we're gonna decide who we're nice to. Okay? But we'll be able to decide. To pick and choose. Yes. That was the whole thing about we're going to decide who we be friends with. They're going to say, oh, I want you guys to be my friend. No. We're going to, be, we're going to make it their honor to be our friends. Mm. All right, that's the last word. Mike Tyson, my man. Iron Mike. All right, motherfucking rap report. All right, what more can I say? What? More? Did I fucking tell you? I don't steer you wrong, I steer you strong. I'll say it again. I don't steer you wrong, I'll steer you strong. Now, I did an entire hour plus more totally different topics on Mike's podcast, Mike Tyson's podcast, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson, uh, which you can listen to and you can see the entire podcast on YouTube, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson. We talk about Mitch Green, talk about when I got my ear bit off, and just all, like, we talk about him smoking... Toad Venom, which is something he's into, which which he, he swears by, and so much more. I want to thank my guest. Uh, I love him. Such a good dude. Uh, what a privilege. Somebody I've been a fan of for so long. Iron Mike Tyson for rocking. Taking us into the deep, deep rounds. 15 rounds of podcasting. Museum quality podcasting with Iron Mike Tyson. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend to listen to this episode. I'm so proud of it. What can I say? Miles, Jordan, take me out of here with something real nice. Oh yeah, something real proper, uh-huh, and something real funky. I'm done. <laughs>